Hi everyone, this is Dr. Osmani and you're welcome to another episode of the Fulbright Women Podcast Season 1, where we bring to you the brightest women of Pakistan and tell you what amazing work they're doing in their field. So, who do we have today? We have Sabazi, someone who went to Fulbright in 2013 to get her Master's in Journalism from Boston University. Saba is currently working at Global News in Canada as an online journalist, and she has also worked with Al Jazeera in the past. I cannot wait to talk to her. Let's welcome her. Hi, Saba. Hi, Safia. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Uh, doing good. Not too bad. That's good to hear, given you know we're all living in this pandemic. And I keep thinking, Saba, just like everything else, what is it like to be a journalist? during the whole pandemic situation? Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been really interesting. I mean, for pretty much, uh, I think, for the purpose of our, um, you know, my work, uh, you know, the way I function, uh, working for a news website, um, we weren't thrown off too much um, in terms of the way we function. Um, because, you know, we're pretty much working online. Um, I've been working from home for the past, uh, you know, more than a year since last March. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely been a different work environment, not being in the newsroom. Um, a lot of the times we'd be out in the field covering events. And that certainly has uh, not been the case. Uh, you know, all my interviews that I've done, I've pretty much been living off of Zoom the past, uh, you know, uh, 15 months. So it's definitely changed the way we work. But I, I think we've all adapted and, and tried to make it work as best as we can. That's right. That's right. I remember Saba back in February, March 2020, when it all actually, you know, was bombarded on us, when we all were learning about it. The whole situation is very chaotic. There was so much panic around everywhere, right? And there were a lot of myths, a lot of like conjecture, speculation. Were you covering COVID from the beginning? And what were some of your strategies if you were covering COVID or, you know, just doing your job at that point? What, how did your strategies shift? Um, yeah, so I think uh, when the first, uh, you know, cases started coming out, um, you know, February, March, and that's when the WHO declared it as a pandemic. I mean, I was on the on the new shift uh, working for Al Jazeera. And, um, you know, I think from the start, you're right, there was so much misinformation uh, and myths around the disease, because we just didn't have the research at the time, we just didn't know much about it. Um, so I think, one thing as you know, we felt as journalists and the news industry that we were looking to do was separate the fix, uh, the facts um, from the myths. So we really focused on these um, really uh, reader friendly explainers from looking at the symptoms, the different modes of transmission and what precautions were needed. Our primary source at the time was, you know, the World Health Organization. Um, so we relied a lot on what they were recommending. Um, but, you know, for us, it was just, you know, another big news event uh, that had happened and uh, there was just so much interest in it. I remember, you know, every day there was one person who was kind of tracking the number of cases um, in each country um, and, and kind of just looking at that. And because everybody, you know, obviously was uh, trying to get a sense of what was happening. So there was definitely a lot of interest. And uh, and for us, it was it was a busy, busy time. And, and still it still is. Yeah, there was a lot of interest. There was a lot of misinformation. There was also a lot of panic. You know, the sense of panic. I felt like, and tell me how you felt, but I felt like panic and fear was spreading faster than the pandemic itself at one point. Uh, would you like to comment on that and the role of media in that situation? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we've had our fair share of, you know, fair mongering headlines related to COVID uh, over the past year. And while an enticing headline would get more people to click on it or watch on TV, I think as... As journalists, you know, we have a responsibility to not be inside in the affair. Um, at the same time, you know, it's not our job to sort of like massage the news. Um, you have to tell it like it is. You know, if there's an outbreak in your community, you know, and the hospitalizations are hitting record levels, you know, so we have to like, there's no two ways to, to go about telling that. Um, you know, one thing that we I've noticed that with the, you know, vaccine rollout now is that there's all this concern around side effects, you know, should you take this vaccine, should you take the other one. Um, so while it's important to be reporting that, you know, this, this is the case, um, we, I think it's all it always helps to do these reality checks, um, you know, a number of pieces that I've done over the past, you know, a few months being on the health beat here and global is that, 
um, you know, just looking at, okay, so these are the variants that are out there. What are the risks? How does this affect, you know, vaccine effectiveness? So just kind of break, breaking it down for the readers so that, you know, we, they're able to sort of make their own judgment in terms of what the situation is. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's already so much fear out there and we've been living in, in this pandemic for the past year. So the last thing we want is to people, you know, feeling more scared when they read the news. That's right. So how did you ensure you get to the right piece of information to, you know, pass on? Uh, yeah, that's been one of the major, you know, challenges of, of COVID is just sifting through all the research uh, that's been going on over the past year. Um, you know, as, as, a, as a health reporter, um, you know, I've, I've sort of sub subscribed to uh, a bunch of medical and scientific journals. And our strategy is not to cover each and every study that comes out, but look at the peer reviewed ones, you know, is the sample size large enough over a thousand, that's sort of the benchmark that we go with. And then on top of that, we try to talk to, you know, a range of experts who are involved in the study as well as other non-affiliated observers. You know, the aim is to kind of lay out the facts and kind of, um, you know, not just throw all the scientific jargon at people, but sort of, um, you know, lay out how, what are the real life implications? You know, how does this affect people? Um, you know, in, in their daily lives, you know, in terms of if it's symptoms for the kids, you know, do they do they quarantine? Do they, you know, how do they go about their, their lives? So kind of just helping um, navigate uh, through all of that. And obviously there's been <clears throat> misleading data as well. So our, you know, way of due diligence, doing due diligence is going to the reliable sources, uh, whether it's the WHO, the health ministries, and, um, you know, other, other experts and sources that we've developed over the, over the course of the year. Was there at any point that you felt overwhelmed or shocked or surprised um, by the piece of information that you were receiving? There's been all kinds of um, you know, information out there. And uh, I think for us, it was, it's kind of, um, it comes with the, with the territory of being a journalist is you always have to verify and fact check every time you put it out there because you have a responsibility once your name or byline's on it or it's from a media news organization, you know, you have that responsibility, you have that conscience in your head. So um, it's definitely been, I would say the amount of, um, there was a word that they kind of tokenized for it is, uh, you know, the pandemic of, of misinformation, because that's, that's how it's been, you know, uh, framed. Uh, and and it, it has been challenging for us, for everybody, you know, as journalists to kind of make sense of what's happening. So it's been a mixed bag, uh, but we've tried to, you know, do the best that we can to kind of make sense of what, what, what the information is, because at the end of the day, you know, we're not experts. Um, we're just trying to get the information out. That's why we're Kind of talk to as many people as possible to, and it's also been interesting how you know I've uh, a number of infectious disease experts I talk to. They even they vary in terms of their own, um, you know, how they view certain uh, you know pieces of evidence that's coming out, and they have their own opinions. So you trying to get everything, all of it together, and, and sort of just present it to 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 the readers and see it kind of make make their own judgment for as it is. Being a journalist, Sabah, um, you know, I would imagine one of the instincts is to get to the scene as quickly as possible so that you could get the information out, right? But the pandemic in COVID-19 actually challenged that instinct to somehow, you know, propel and compel the journalists to find a creative way around, you know, their journalism, their process of journalism. Can you talk about that a bit? Um, so I, I guess the good thing about, you know, working for, for the online side is that at least from our perspective, um, we haven't been affected too, too much. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I've been working from home, um, doing a lot of my uh, interviews over Zoom and over the phone. But it, definitely for a reporter being on the field, that kind of is like the bread and butter. Like that's how you get all your information. And, um, you know, we haven't been able to do that. I haven't been able to cover any of the events that I would have wanted. Um, you know, the first field assignment that I actually had in over a year was it was in June this uh, this year. I, um, you know, I recall I was asked to go cover a vigil in London, Ontario. And when the attack on the Pakistani Muslim family happened and my first instinct was, you know, yes, I wanted to go out there without question. 
because uh, you know you you miss you miss those personal contacts. So it's definitely been, um, and also on, on on the other side, you know, not seeing your colleagues, uh, not being around the newsroom, because a lot of your best ideas that come out for news for uh, for stories is when you you know bounce off ideas of other other people, your editor, and it's kind of restrictive uh, being able to do that in in a in an online environment where you're talking to people on Zoom or Slack. So it's it's definitely a different uh, vibe. But uh, I think we've given the circumstances we've made it work and I think in fact the past year I think it's been the busiest that that has been at least personally for me as a journalist because just because of the you know uh, the news cycle that's happened uh, with the pandemic. How does that restriction of mobility um, affect the mental process of you know working? Um, I guess it's been challenging because when you're working remotely, um, you know, and you're working from home, there's really no distinction when it comes to, you know, home and your office. So I guess one of the challenges is that, uh, you know, you're overworking um, and then and on top of that, you know, there's really no escape and especially in the middle of a lockdown you're not socializing. So you ended up, you know, logging way more hours than, than you would want it. Um, and it's, I guess it's also restrictive uh, for a journalist uh, while, you know, we can talk to people on the phone or over the zoom, but um, you, for, you know, personal stories where you want to set the scene and you want to actually physically be there. Uh, that's definitely not been the case. Uh, so it's, it's kind of made us, you know, Kind of, it's a bit, bit of a compromise that you've had to make, um, given the circumstances. But I, I still feel like it's, it's a way that, um, that we might have to end up, you know, going forward, even when the pandemic is over, because we know that this is some is another option that we can, uh, we can function with. You said restrictive, and that made me think about, you know, because this was such a big, this has been and still currently is a global, you know, healthcare crisis. And different governments have been trying to deal with it in their own ways. There's also been, you know, more than 80 different governments kind of try to put restrictions um, on, you know, media, on journalists. And that was restrictive for, you know, many journalists as well, of course. Did you uh, experience anything personally or know of stories of, you know, fellow peers who experienced that? And... What do you have to comment on that? Um, yeah, th definitely. I think uh, there was also this um, amnesty report, I think recently that kind of highlighted how, um, you know, governments are using the pandemic as a way to silence uh, critics and, and even media censorship. And in a lot of countries it's happened um, where, you know, uh, they'll use that as an excuse to not let you be, uh, you know, either protesting or, 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 or being out on the field to do your job. Um, um, I think personally for me, other than, you know, the normal restrictions and not being able to go to events in person or cover them live, I think my work um, has not been compromised to a great extent. Uh, but yeah, I think on the whole, it's, it's a trend that we've been seeing uh, a lot. And it's obviously, it's not something that you would want because at the end of the day, you know, as journalists, we're just trying to do our job and try to get the truth out, um, you know, get the get the stories out as, as, as good as possible. And, 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 and a lot of them, a lot of the journalists that are out on the field still, you know, they're, they're risking their lives. They're, even though, you know, they're taking all the precautions necessary but they're still, you know, trying to just to get their job, out, um, you know, get their, um, you know, stories out there, you know, being out in the field, um, you know, talking to people and, and just risking even catching COVID. And so it's, it's definitely, you know, it's been, it's been a mixed bag, but I, you know, I've, I personally, if I talk about my experience, I've been lucky in that sense that I haven't had um, that, you know, kind of restriction. And I've sort of, you know, been told to actually, you know, it was my decision, even when I wanted to cover the recent vigil that I did, you know, there were so many different layers of questions that was, you know, are you comfortable going out there? You know, are you okay traveling with this person? So, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's always, obviously nice to have that support uh, from, from your editors and from your managers, but um, a lot of people and all journalists have not been so lucky to do that. As a health journalist, could you give us some insights of where do we stand in terms of the pandemic currently? 
Oh, that's that's a million dollar question, right? Is it is it getting is it getting over now? Um, you know, I think it's you know, every time we see cases going down, you know, there's all this optimism. Um, I think uh, I think the general consensus that I've seen uh, from a lot of the um, uh, the infectious disease experts that I've spoken to is that you know, with more vaccinations happening, obviously, uh, that's going to make a difference in terms of not more, uh, you know, lesser people ending up in hospitals or, or getting uh, extremely sick. But the overall, the thing is, you know, it depends on which part of the world you are. Um, the pandemic is not going to be over um, until it's over everywhere. And right now, like I'm sitting here in Toronto, Canada, where there's like more than 60% of people are vaccinated, you know, cases are going down. But when all the other way on the other side of the world, you know, you're somewhere in countries in like Africa or you know, even in Pakistan where everybody's, you know, not vaccinated and it's not as, you know, not as smooth sailing. And um, so it's, it's definitely it's going to take a while for the world as a whole to get back to normal where we'll be able to travel, get on a flight and, and you know, go wherever um, without having all these restrictions and this, you know, fear around, around COVID. So, yeah, I guess we're. We'll have to see see how how that go plays out. Yeah, you raised a very good point, which is an obvious one, but sometimes it feels like you know countries are unable to get a grasp on it. And you said it's not over till it's over for all of us, right? Um, and we all noticed in the beginning, you know, how when it was all about vaccines, uh, how different governments were trying to hoard some vaccines, right? And even right now, it's a big debate around the world how the richer countries are trying to get most of the vaccines and the you know, not so rich ones are left to just be on their own without the world really realizing that we have to share and heal and get rid of this pandemic together. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, the vaccine inequity and, you know, ethics around, um, you know, richer countries being able to get um, all this, uh, you know, uh, all these doses um, is, is definitely been a controversial one. I mean, I'm living, I'm living in Canada and it's, it's amazing how they have the uh, highest uh, number of doses per capita. They've ordered so many vaccines that they don't even need that much for their, for their amount of population that they have. So that's been one of the, you know, the, um, you know, the boiling points here is that, you know, they, how first world countries can help um, you know, uh, the, the third world and trying to get those vaccines. I mean, I think the WHO, they did come out with this instrument, which they call the COVAX facility, where which was the purpose is basically to, um, you know, for richer countries to buy and, you know, share uh, these vaccine, uh, uh, you know, doses with, with uh, you know, less, um, less uh, lower income countries. So um, I think it's still in a work in progress and <clears throat> it's, it's going to take time before, um, you know, we'll, we'll be able to get to a point where um, everybody has been able to get vaccinated right now. Another um, issue that we're seeing is with the booster shots. Um, you know, there's yeah. there are the people who are not even they don't even have their first dose. And now, um, you know, uh, people are thinking of getting the third or fourth shot. So, yeah, like I said, it's it's not over until it's over for everyone. And uh, we sort of need to kind of have that sort of approach um, so I can own a sort of falls on all these are uh, you know high income countries for them to do their role um and uh as well as the who can you expand a bit more on the moral implications of the booster shots you know because there's also this debate around you know this conversation that's happening that there is a large population of the world that hasn't even received their first shot and uh, while there's you know a segment of the population that is hoping to get or aiming to get a booster shot. There is a moral implication there. Could you talk about that? Um, yeah, for sure. I think, um, and also from a moral perspective and scientific perspective as well, there a lot of people are at this point, you know, saying that, <clears throat> you know, maybe because there's not a lot of studies or evidence out there when it comes to even knowing that we need a booster shot or when do we need a booster shot? Like there's there's no set timeline. Um, you know, Pfizer is still doing studies. Moderna has, hasn't really come out with one yet. So it's it's still a work in progress. And for people to kind of jump to that um, next step uh, before, uh, you know, there are <clears throat> other people who are not even uh, don't even have their first dose. So it's it's definitely, it, it puts it, you know, puts your moral, you know, like you said, and ethical concerns are, are raised. <clears throat> Sorry. 
And, um, you know, a lot of the time I've, I've spoken to a couple of bioethicists when it comes to these issues around prioritizing vaccines. <clears throat> Sorry. Do you want to take a break I and guess. have some water? <laughs> no, I'm good. I was just like, <laughs> something got stuck. That's um, all right. I, can I, yeah. Um, yeah, I can, we can repeat. Um, so I guess, yeah, it, it just comes down to, um, you know, looking at where, how do we prioritize um, people getting their shots first and, and sort of um, making sure that uh, it, it was the vast majority of the people are actually fully vaccinated first before we can move on to the next stage. There, Saba, I also noticed this politics of vaccine, as I would like to term it, you know, different countries rolled out different vaccines. And then there was this talk, and you can shed a light on it as a health journalist, how certain countries were not accepting travelers or people who are getting vaccinations of certain countries. Do you want to talk about that? Is there any truth to it? Yeah, that's definitely a very controversial topic. Um, in fact, one of my colleagues did a story just last night about how a lot of, um, you know, countries are not accepting people who've uh, mixed their doses, because that's one strategy that Canada and, and some another a few of the European countries have done is that they've started mixing doses between uh, interchanging between the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer, Pfizer, Moderna. So um, there's definitely been a lot of uh, debate around that. And even when it comes to recognizing vaccines, you know, uh, for instance, I'll give you the example of, of <clears throat> Canada, like they've, they've uh, approved uh, the AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, um, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, but they have not, uh, they, do, they have not authorized, uh, you know, the Chinese vaccines or the Sputniks. Mm -hmm. Although when you look at the scientific um, evidence, you know, they're equally effective, you know, mRNA vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, they're equally effective. AstraZeneca is a great vaccine. It's getting a bad reputation for having these side effects for, from blood clots. So um, I guess it, it's kind of come down to how these, ma these vaccine manufacturers market themselves. But I think at the end of the day, we all need to, maybe there's, there has to be a standardized a way of going about it so that, you know, countries do not um, differentiate uh, vaccine recipients based on what what brand they got. I think um, because if WHO has recognized something, I think that should sort of stand, that should hold true. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, every country is kind of uh, going about doing their own thing and creating their own policies, which is going to create, uh, you know, a lot of problems for, for travelers uh, going forward. That's right. Um, going forward. How do you see the near future? Uh, yeah, that's the million dollar question. I mean, I think, um, you know, we sort of when the pandemic first started, you know, it was March and we thought, you know, we, we little did we know that, you know, five months, 15 months down the road, we'd still be in it. Um, and I think a lot of the things that people have uh, said is that the pandemic, um, it, there's a form of it, it might just keep being around just like the flu season that we have each year. Uh, it might not be, it might not go away completely. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're going to have to sort of learn to live with. Um, I think a lot of the habits that we've already developed over the past year, they are going to stick with us uh, when it, obviously when it comes to your hygiene. Um, I think the work from home situation, that's something that a lot of people have gotten comfortable with. It might, there might be a hybrid model um, going ahead, but uh, you know, life as we know it pre COVID, I, I don't think it's, it's gonna, it's not going to go back to that anytime soon. And, and that's something that we, I think we're all sort of mentally prepared for, and we've all obviously gotten used to it uh, with, with the past year. So yeah, it's, it's going to be right. a lot of us, you know, Someone was saying this to me the other day, we were having this conversation that the pandemic is not yet over, but somehow, you know, this brilliant ability of humans to adapt, you know, that has taken over. So the fear that we were talking about that was there in early 2020 and the panic and this sense of, you know, what's going to happen, that is kind of reduced, right? We have learned to live with it. And hopefully we're all together able to, uh, if not beat the pandemic, get some kind of control over it. And like you said, there has to be a way of, you know, getting rid of the politics that's happening around the vaccine and the healthcare. And hopefully we can find a way that works for everyone in terms of equality. 
Yeah, that's the hope. I think there's definitely a, at this point, uh, people are there's the morale is definitely higher. Um, obviously, depends on which part of the world you are, but it's definitely we feel like the light is there. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, whether it's the end of this year or the next. But I think, I think we've sort of uh, come away from from the worst peak that we've or most of the countries have seen. Um, and I think with more vaccines coming out and people just getting getting used to the way uh, we live our lives, it's it's definitely uh, we're hoping hoping that it it all ends soon. And and yeah, the mental resilience. I think the impact that this. Uh, disease has had on people's obviously physically it has but the mental health um, that it has no matter which walk of life you were in and we've seen that with studies and in personal experiences so the mental resilience of people has really been tested and I think um, you know hopefully it hasn't done that long lasting damage for a lot of the people so um, that's right that's right have... do you want to talk about the mental toll that it perhaps took on you um, for sure. Uh, I think for me, um, I think the past, uh, you know, one year, I've pretty much been in isolation, a working from home. And then um, initially, I was in Qatar with my parents. So I, you know, obviously, wouldn't go out much, didn't want to risk bringing COVID back home. And then when I moved here to Toronto, um, Ontario has been in, you know, under very strict lockdown for the most part of it. Um, and only now it started opening up a bit. So that's, it hasn't been easy. It, it makes it especially challenging and frustrating is that, you know, a, you're living in a pandemic, and then you're also covering the pandemic. So there's literally no escape or breathing room. Um, you know, it's funny, even when in social interactions from day to day you know people since they know i've sort of been covering this they'll, they'll ask me you know is is mixing vaccines um you know safe can we get a booster so it's like it's covid everywhere so and then so it's, it's definitely been challenging but i feel like i've you know managed um you know with my routines i'm a regular runner um you know former athlete i that's something that i've stuck with yeah. and having my routine so I've sort of like stayed true to that um, to kind of keep my my mental mental health in check. And it's always obviously good to uh, keep checking up on on your friends, either it's, you know, through virtual ways and, um, you know, calling calling your, your, your parents, your family, just to kind of, uh, you know, stay, uh, stay sane through all this craziness that's happening. Yeah, stay sane and healthy. Well, um, Thank you for giving your time. And I know we decided that we're going to be talking about the pandemic and your career as a journalist and you're working as you know, a health journalist. But you mentioned something really interesting. And I don't want to leave you without asking this one question. You run. Give at least one running tip, you know, of how to improve the form or what is the right form when you're running. Any tip before we leave? Uh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, I mean, I mean, I start g g started getting into running long distance running only a couple of years ago um, when I started entering in you know, all these half marathons and stuff. So I think for me, it's just the start is, is, is the most important. You once you start and you get into that rhythm. Um, there's really you no, know, I think it's, it's more mind, it's more mental. That's what I think with, with running, especially with long distances, it's more mental than it's physical. Um, you know, my, my way of going about it is I, I put my music on and I kind of just get lost in my own world. Some people like to run with people in company. Um, it helps them push them, uh, push themselves. But I, I, you know, I just have my, you know, the best playlist on and, you know, it's got a nice um, track or, you know, some, the weather is good, you know, there's nothing stopping you. <laughs> That, that's actually great. And what you said was actually something that can also be applied to anything in life. It's more mind than, you know, it's more your mindset than anything else. And I hope that we can all, you know, create and maintain a positive mindset to kind of beat this pandemic as well. And thank you so much, Saba, for taking out time to speak with me. And I hope to stay in touch with you in the future as well. Thank you, Safiya. It was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thanks for having me on and uh, all the best. Of course. Thank you so much. You have a great day. Bye. You too. Bye.